Monday to get through most, well, all of this and in probably through the males hormone regulation of gamete production. So I gave you guys a brief little intro a bit on Monday about thinking about how many oocytes, how many ova females produce during fetal development, right? That seven million potential eggs. You're born with two million, that was natural selection. We're not quite sure how it does it, it just does that. By the time you reach sexual maturity, we were down to 400,000 ova, 200,000 in each ovary. We have these things called primordial follicles that will evolve and develop into primary follicles, which evolve into secondary follicles, gapping, matures, kind of thing. And we're trying to follow the hormone pathway that does this. We're going to be looking at a selection process that's going to start on the first day of menstruation. So when menstrual bleeding is noticed, that's the first day of this ovarian cycle. It's going to relate to the, to the uterine cycle. So we're going to be kind of looking at this idea on slide 12. We're going to be looking at two things simultaneously. The idea of the ovarian cycle up here, and then the idea of the uterine cycle down here. And for the moment, since we're here, we can take the uterine cycle and the ovarian cycle and put it into two phases, one called the the follicular phase, and we call them the luteal phase. Keep in mind that the follicular phase is the one that's variable. If the, quote, average menstrual cycle is 28 days, it can be as high as 35, 40 days, and sometimes even longer. And that's gonna, that variation will happen just in the follicular aspect. The luteal is not gonna be variable. It's gonna be carbon, biological concrete. So let's go back to the very first day of this. And we're looking at the first day of menstruation. And we have this idea, it's called a pulsatile release of GnRH. This is different than other hormones. We talked about maybe CRH going down to trigger the release of ACTH or TRH leading to release of TSH. That was a continuous stream of releasing hormones. This is pulsatile. A frequency of every 60 to 90 minutes. I smell cigarettes. I think my nose all stuffy. So, pulsatile release of 60 to 90 minutes will trigger the release of FSH first. All right, and look at the name, follicle stimulating. I need to get our primordial follicles to be stimulated, and that's the job of FSH. And that's going to start causing them to release some estradiol. And estradiol will then do a paracrine signaling system. So as you look at this picture here, we start getting a layer of granulose cells. That's what's going to come from these simple squamous-like cells. These little flattened ones turn into the cuboidal ones. We're going to call them granulose cells. We have one layer, then we start getting two layers, or getting three layers. That's simply just due to mitosis. And that's due to that green arrow low levels of estradiol, triggering mitotic activity of the granulose cells. And by about the second or third, about the second day, we start noticing LH reaching the theca cells, and that means the granulose cells have to have receptors for FSH, <coughs> the theca cells have to have receptors for the LH. I'm hoping it's somewhat straightforward that when LH goes to the theca cell, that triggers them to create that blue aromatase enzyme. You know it's an enzyme because it ends in ASE. Aromatase will go through a little gap in my diagram. That's a gap junction. Right? This is a gap junction. What we're looking at basically is theca cells connected to granulose cells, just like we have in the diagram. Those theca cells connected to those granulose cells. So every one of these little granulose cells and every one of these theca cells is doing this pattern right here. All thecas are making androgens. All granulosa cells are making aromatase, and all granulosa cells are making low levels of estradiol, and that's how we can develop this primary follicle. And we're looking at about 15 to 20 primordials being activated. Now, to make you guys really smart, and to also get in my little teeny mini pedestal of a pet peeve of mine, like the word hypothesis and theory, how we use them in language, 
There is no such thing really as estrogen. Try and get you guys to really work on that. It is a family of hormones, and they're called estrogens, and we're looking at three primary ones. The most important one is estradiol. It is the one in predominant amount. It's about 80 times more potent than the other forms. I'm not quite sure how they figured that out. It was something I had to learn myself. They're just really, really, really more significant than the other two, which would be estrone, whoops, there's an R there, and estriol. And the one we're focusing on is this one, and that's the one people really mean when they say estrogen. We're talking about the number one form here of estradiol. So we'll work on you guys trying to say that rather than saying estrogens. So John, it's the granulose of those that produce the low level of estradiol. Mm -hmm. with the, okay. That's what the arrow is coming out with. Yeah. Interestingly enough, since aromatase is leading to the production of estradiol, we'll hold that thought. Hang on. I'm going to shut up and keep going. All right, a couple days later, we've been doing this for a few days now. We may have lost five, six, or seven of our original 15 to 20. They just simply have not responded, and they're going to be absorbed and digested. But now the idea is this. Our primary follicle that we had back over here is even bigger now, and we start secreting a fluid from some of the granulose cells to make what's called an antrum. And since my follicle is bigger, I'll have more granulose cells. And since I have more granulose cells, I can make more hormone. It's that straightforward. That's why we can see an increase in the level of estradiol. Plus, the cells are also more efficient at making that hormone. They ramped up their enzyme production individually. So I can make more hormone, so we can see that we have medium levels of estradiol. And now what you want to keep track of is this. I want you to notice that we're going to be talking about how the hypothalamus, the pituitary, is responding to estradiol in different ways. The response is dependent upon the level of hormone. Right now we have medium levels of estradiol doing a negative feedback to decrease the amount of GnRH and to decrease the amount of FSH and LH. Think what we did just a few days earlier, right? We had this release of the follicle stimulating to basically get going a bunch of primordials to become a primary. The goal is for that primary Hang on, you gotta go the right, right direction. The goal is to get at least one primordial developed and matured all the way to a follicle that's ready to actually ovulate. Now, since we started on day one to activate a bunch of primordials, by the time we're four or five days into this process, I need a signal that tells my ovaries to not awaken another group of primordial follicles. These guys were already five days into their maturation process. I can't have some that are five days into their developmental process and start a whole new batch that will be five days younger in their developmental stages. That's why we have the negative feedback. It's sort of like this analogy I had last night. You guys started fall quarter, let's just say on September 23rd. It's now September 23rd, it's now October 15th. You guys can't start fall quarter on October 15th. You already started. We have to finish the quarter out before a new group of students can come in. We need to finish the quarter out before a new group of follicles can be activated and started up again. To make sure we do that, we have a negative feedback on GnRH, FSH, and LH to see what happens to this group as they go through their maturation process. And that's due to medium levels of estradiol. This would be about the mid follicular phase. And this is where I kind of wish we had two projectors. So I apologize for stopping you guys and kind of going back and forth here. But let's go again back to that slide 12. All right, where we have the average menstruation of you know three to seven days of bleeding. 
right? And we're looking at now kind of the mid. See, there's my low estradiol, right, corresponding to the original notice of bleeding, right? Then we start getting to about medium levels. So the bleeding has stopped. Now we're starting to regrow that stratum functionalis layer. That stratum basal layer is starting to add more cells and create a brand new functional layer. Because we're right about here, right? And we're helping to develop our follicle. There's our antrum that's developing. Now with that, a few days later, right, toward the latter part, just about a day or two before actual ovulation, notice what happened to the level of estradiol. It's gone up even more. But now notice it's no longer doing a negative feedback. It's actually doing a stimulation signal. But there's going to be a little catch to this. First notice that my granule, or the granulo cells, right, all those guys in there, right, which were these guys right here, they're a few days older, more developed, the antrum now is really developed, we're looking at this mature follicle in this scenario. All of those follicle cells, right, the granulo cells and the theca cells, and more importantly, the granulo cells, are now making three different hormones, not just estradiol. They've really ramped up the estradiol production, but now they're making a hormone called inhibin. And look what inhibin is inhibitin. It's working as a negative feedback on FSH. Again, we're gonna maintain the brakes on attempting to awaken any other primordials. Because we're about midway through our cycle here. We can't awaken a whole new group. We have to finish out this graduated class in a sense. But I'm also needing to get the ova out of the follicle. So to do that, I need to create a massive release of LH hormone. And how do I create a massive release of LH? Well, I take my large level of estradiol, goes hypothalamus and tells it to release more GnRH. I think of that as like one order for GnRH. I then notice my granule cells making another hormone called progesterone. And I just started to make it, so the levels are low. But those low levels of, of progesterone can go up to the hypothalamus right, and tell it to release more GnRH. And in my mind, that's now two orders for GnRH. Then I realize how this whole system works. Remember, releasing hormones from the endocrine system come from a neuroendocrine cell, the hypothalamus. What's that capillary bed that they travel down through to get to the pituitary called? Hypothalamus pituitary portal system, right? And I know that releasing hormones have a target of the antipituitary. And in this case, their target is to tell the antipituitary to release more FSH and LH. So I can consider two orders coming down to the antipituitary. Now, as the pituitary thinks about releasing FSH, it realizes, oh, wait a minute, we have a cancel order here in the form of inhibin, saying, man, really don't, don't make FSH, dude. But I have no breaks on LH. And progesterone is not only going to hypothalamus, it's also going directly to the edge of pituitary, telling it to directly make LH. In my mind, that's my third order for LH. I have two orders for GnRH. I'm going to get two releases of orders. So the pituitary gets banged twice for a GnRH. But there's also a direct one for LH as well. That's gonna give me a large amount of LH while we have a trickle of FSH. Remember, feedback systems never turn off completely hormone production. It just reduces the amount of production. Is this making some sense? Now let's go to the next slide. Right here, now in green at the top where it says high estradiol and low progesterone, that is this right here. I just put it on the same slide so we can remember what had happened a moment ago, right? There's my one level, my one order for GnRH, my second order for GnRH. That would give me two orders going down here, but there's also one directly on to the pituitary. So I'm gonna get a mass amount of LH with just a little teeny bit of FSH. Now that one box where it says follicle cells and ova, is my simplified version of this whole structure. We're no longer looking at individual cells. 
you're now thinking of the whole structure as an entirety. So this is my one box of follicle cells, which would be granulose and pica, plus the ova inside. That is my mature follicle. It receives the LH surge. When the LH surge has peaked, it's at, at its maximum highest level, I am then starting this time clock on my arrow, my 16 to 18 hour time clock. Now, remember what I tried, John, maybe, maybe didn't tell you guys this part. I took several different books' descriptions of this process and tried to create an average conversation through the use of these slides. Some books will give you a 36 to 38 hour window, but they're starting the clock at the beginning of LH release. Some books take it at the peak of LH release, which is what I do, the LH surge. It's at the peak amount, and at that peak, I then start my clock. And I ask, how many hours until I see the ova actually leaving the follicle structure? And that's 16 to 18 hours. Now we can see that, and I apologize for going forward. We're going to go through this twice. Let's go to slide nine, just for a moment. Where I can look at a couple of things. On the very bottom graph, <laughs> yeah, okay. There's that nasty word, right? And there's my low level of estrogens, right? And then there's my medium level of, of estradiol. And then there's my high estradiol. But notice what high estradiol is corresponding to. A low level of progesterone, right? Low progesterone, high estradiol, led to an LH surge. And there's my peak right there. And see how the, the peak of my green line is not on the dotted line, it's just before it. That dotted line is ovulation. So from the peak of that green line to the dotted line is that 16 to 18 hour window. And once I get that peak of LH, 16 to 18 hours later, some women actually feel a bit of a pinprick. And I used to have, well I don't used to have, she used to, I still have the friend, but she used to um, for years, if it was a joke, would just send me a text message, right? <laughs> left, right, left, once a month. And she could feel herself ovulating. And she would just simply say, oh, right one, left one, right one, left one, because she knew I was a biology major and just wanted to have some fun with it, <laughs> right? But now what we have is, once the ova has left the follicle, it isn't just the ova, right? We can see right here that there are some follicle cells still surrounding the ova itself. Now we have to remember, also, the ova had DNA in it. Do you remember the meiotic division that that DNA was held in? Prophase one, right? It's still in prophase one. During these surges of estradiol, that hasn't changed. The egg leaves the follicular structure with some remaining granule cells surrounding it. And there's another layer we haven't really talked about called the zona pellucida. So when I look at my egg, if my red light is a sperm cell, the sperm have to burrow through a couple of layers of granulose cells. All right. They have to burrow through a, the zona pellucida, which is this layer right there, and then the plasma membrane of the ova itself. And that's going to take a lot of oomph to be able to do. But because of the LH surge, at the peak of the surge, 18 hours later, this ova with some surrounding granulose cells right, is ejected from the follicular structure. Now that will stay in the ova. This is now headed to the infundibulum and the ampulla and the isthmus of the fallopian tubes. Oops, wrong direction. But now see, there's my follicle cells, right? So this cloud of puffy follicle cells is this stuff right here. Well, dude, get your finger right. Those, remember, those cells were the ones producing the estradiol and the progesterone and the inhibin. So they're still making their hormones. But now how, what is the level of progesterone production from these remaining follicle cells that are still in the ovary? Yes. Why don't you look at the slide? Higher. Higher. No. Higher. It's high, estradiol. high progesterone, right, and medium high coming from those follicle cells. Remember, 
Those guys were the ones doing the, the estradiol inhibitor and progesterone. Now they're doing this. They've upped up the progesterone production and they've reduced their estradiol production. And they're still doing inhibitor like they always have been. Right? And if you have a hard time kind of grasping the picture, let's go to slide nine. Right, we can see that happening. LH surge, ovulation, look what happened to estradiol. It lowered to a medium high level and there's my increasing progesterone. We have high progesterone, medium high estradiol, coming from the follicle cells that are still in the ovary. And what are these high levels of progesterone and medium high levels of estradiol doing? They're doing another negative feedback. Now this is what's gonna be really important to learn these one slide at a time. All right. A moment ago, we had a signal of high estradiol doing a stimulation pathway. But now with lower levels of estradiol and high levels of progesterone, we have a negative feedback pathway. It's because remember what just happened, we ovulated the egg and the whole purpose of this is to get pregnancy and implantation of the embryo into the uterine lining. I don't want to start another ovarian cycle if I'm going to be pregnant. So we have to wait and see what actually happens to that ovulated ova. So we have another on the break scenario. Remember that high surge of estradiol, right, was to cause the LH surge. But remember, we put the brakes on the FSH part of that LH surge. Now that the ova has been released, heading toward the ephemerae and the fundibulum and the ampulla, I have a really strong message of negative feedback of no GnRH, well, I won't say no, really low levels of GnRH, really low levels of LH, because that's what started this whole thing in the, process, in the beginning. What's in birth control pills? Estradiol and progesterone. This red signal, this negative feedback, is what birth control pills are mimicking. Making you think you've just ovulated. So we don't actually mature a bunch of follicles to actually ovulate. Now the question is, how long is this structure called the corpus luteum gonna maintain its negative feedback signal? Well, it's gonna be, it depends. You have two possible choices. You can either maintain that negative feedback for 10 to 12 days, and the end of 10 to 12 days, you're gonna to begin to die and shrivel up and stop producing your hormones which means the level of estradiol is gonna lower, the level of progesterone is gonna lower, and when you lower the negative feedback, you're giving permission for GnRH to begin its pulsatile release again, and we start all over again. And when that happens, you become the corpus albicans. And if you look at the diagram, are there any arrows coming from the corpus albicans? No. No, nope. that means there's no hormones produced, right? There are no arrows. Nothing's coming from that. That means there's no negative feedback. Well, the other option is, but what if you are pregnant? Because if, if I have a drop in progesterone, which we can see here, right, and a drop of estradiol, that low level progesterone and that lowering of estradiol, when it gets to a certain low level, is a threshold in a sense, triggers menstruation, the shedding of the stratum functionalis, the shedding of the endometrial lining. And if I happen to have a developing embryo in there, I wouldn't want that. I don't want to slough off that layer of tissue. So how do I make sure that I don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak? Well, that's where that negative feedback signal comes in. It takes about 10 days for an ova to travel down the fallopian tubes. That's thought number one. It takes 10 days to reach the uterine cavity. All right, how long does an ova live for though? Just by itself, how long does an egg live for? Oh God, don't we teach that in high school for God's sakes? 24 hours, that's it. An unfertilized egg only lives for 24 hours. How long do sperm cells live for on average? Five to seven days. Oh my gosh. I don't know who to call, but we gotta start teaching you guys better sex ed. All right? Unfertilized eggs only live for 24 hours. That is not a whole lot of window of opportunity. 
Spartan lived five to seven days. Really, three to five. Five to seven is kind of pushing it. So here's the idea. If it takes 10 days to travel from the fembre, right, and the ampule where fertilization usually is, my little red light is now a fertilized egg, and I'm traveling down those ciliated columnar cells, right, and I get to here. It takes about 10 days to get there. Oh, gee, 10 days. That's about the time that normally <coughs> the corpus luteum becomes a corpus albicans. And if that happens, those cells stop releasing high levels of progesterone and estradiol, I lose my negative feedback. We're gonna shed that uterine lining. So how do we not let that happen? The developing embryo starts to produce a chemical hormone. It's three because all hormones are chemicals. A chemical signal called HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin. That hormone signal coming from the embryo and the developing placenta tells the corpus luteum, um, excuse me, we're pregnant, we're here. Please don't shed the lining that I'm trying to build the house into. So maintain your existence for 60 to 90 days. Give me a chance to get big enough where I can become the source of the negative feedback. Takes about three months for that to happen. And until then, the corpus luteum is the one maintaining the breaks on GnRH and FSH and this whole ovarian cycle starting all over again. But once the embryo and the placenta can now create that HCG hormone, then finally after 90 days, the corpus luteum begins to atrophy and die. Its production of hormones diminishes. You lose the negative feedback from it, but the embryo is now the source of the negative feedback. And either way, you become a corpus albicans. How do women test to see if they're pregnant? Who what? What, they just pee and look at it and go, no, not pregnant. What do you pee on? What do pregnancy tests detect? HCG. That's what they're looking for. And they can detect that, then they go, okay, we have pregnancy going. One thing I, I did fail to mention, that we'll mention now that we'll take a bit of a break and go through it all over again in more of an uninterrupted fashion, is when we get to this high estradiol, low progesterone for that massive amount of LH, the pulsatile frequency speeds up to about every 30 to 60 minutes. It's a much faster pulse release. And then when we have our high level of progesterone, it slows back down again. What, what, what period? Do what? what? Say that again, please. How about what makes it speed up for the It's the high estradiol and the low progesterone. Oh. That's what tells them to speed up. All right, that's a lot of info. So we're going to give you guys a 10 minute break. All right, thank you. And then we're going to walk through it again. Because it can be a bit confusing.